Let's talk about 1796 pattern hilts, symmetrical hilts, and being left-handed. So a gentleman called Graham got in contact with me uh, today as it happens, uh, which is what has spurred me to do this video, that's been something that's been on my mind for a while. And that is uh, I, a question I get asked very, very often by left-handed fencers. They say, I want to buy an antique sword, but I've noticed that most um, antique sword hilts are um, made for right-handed people, and this is true. Um, in the 18th, 19th century, it was pretty normal if you were left-handed to be told to do things right-handed instead. Obviously not in all spheres of life, and we do know that left-handed fences existed in abundance. Left-handed fences are referred to in um, fencing manuals and other sources. Uh, and additionally, there were left-handed people doing other things as well. But in a military context, remember that uh, if you have a line of cavalrymen or a line of people with muskets with bayonets fitted, you want them all the same way round, generally speaking. You don't generally want your, at least your men, you might make an exception for officers, but you generally don't want the uh, rank and file, the private soldiers, the troopers, you don't want them holding their sword in the wrong hand uh, because it will mess up your line. If you're riding knee to knee uh, with your other uh, cavalrymen, uh, you've all got your swords on one side and you're all holding your horse's reins in one hand and it's, uh, it has to kind of go like that. It's a similar thing if we go to earlier periods where shields were used if you want to build a shield wall. Generally speaking, you need everybody to be holding the shield in the same hand and you need everyone to be holding the weapon in the same hand. There may possibly have at various points been experiments with having left-handed people on the other end of the line to sort of close off the end of the shield line. This is all supposition. We don't really know. I've never seen any sources talking about that at all. But even in the medieval period, uh, when we look at the combat treatises, they do make references to left-handers. So left-handers obviously existed, certainly in a one-on-one -on -one fighting um, environment. Certainly left-handed duelists are referred to, but in a military context, less so. Now, in 1796, um, the uh, British War Department um, decided, or the Board of Ordnance, as, as it was then actually, uh, decided to introduce three new models of sword um, for the heavy cavalry, light cavalry and infantry officers. Um, now uh, let's just very briefly talk about the difference between heavy cavalry and light cavalry. So generally speaking heavy cavalry were um, supposedly originally riding bigger heavier horses and originally a lot of heavy cavalry were cuirassiers. They had a, a breastplate and a helmet if we go back to the English Civil War period. Um, however, by the Napoleonic period, that's not really the case, certainly not in Britain anymore, and in many other countries as well. And in fact, the difference between heavy and light cavalry had really kind of um, become more of how they were uh, tactically deployed or how they tended to be deployed on the battlefield. And the tendency on paper, although this wasn't always a reality, was that heavy cavalry were supposed to deliver that shock charge. Um, often into enemy infantry, and light cavalry were supposed to scout around, attack the flanks, attack the artillery, do all this kind of stuff. So generally speaking, uh, the idea, if not the reality, the idea was that light cavalry were supposed to be faster moving, more mobile, less likely to get into a uh, sort of duking it out in a melee, hit and run kind of troops. But there was also a fashion and a stylistic difference between the two. Light cavalry were based on um, Central and Eastern European hussars and other types of um, light cavalry. So they tended to be armed with, certainly by the Napoleonic period, well from 1796, uh, 1788 onwards, they tended to be armed with um, sabres um, for numerous reasons. And we could go into the kind of mechanical, why is a sabre better for light cavalry and all this kind of stuff. But actually, in terms of Britain and the 1796 uh, pattern specifically, really it's because of Austro-Hungarian, perhaps even sort of Polish and, and other Eastern European influence. Um, so, and you can even bring influence in there as well from people like the Mamluks and the Egyptian campaign, all this kind of stuff. So there was an idea that light cavalry were modeled on this sort of uh, Central and Eastern European and perhaps even uh, kind of Oriental and North African uh, influences. And so they were given sabers because they were seen as curved swords, were seen as something that came from somewhere else. Whereas the heavy cavalry, 
were more traditionally European uh, in origin and kind of traced their way back all the way back to the 16th and 17th centuries and ultimately you could say knights uh, but really Certainly in Britain, if you look at uh, Cromwell's, um, Cromwell's heavy cavalry, uh, Cromwell's cavalry, that's kind of the root of where we get uh, the later Napoleonic era heavy cavalry from. Um, and so they're given swords which actually functionally are very similar to some 17th century swords, things like Walloon uh, hilted swords and uh, mortuary hilted swords, basket hilt, stuff like this, with a more protective hilt and a straight, in this case, essentially back sword blade. Um, and then not to forget, in the same year, in 1796, infantry officers got a new sword as well. And really this was more about creating a regulation pattern because what had gone before in Britain was kind of a bit random. Infantry officers were all using different types of swords. And so they introduced the famous, as I've spoken about many times on my channel, not always positively, the 1796 pattern um, spadroon. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the video, one thing to note about these three 1796 pattern hilts for light cavalry, okay, um, and for infantry officers, and for heavy cavalry is that they are all symmetrical. They are all symmetrical hilts. And so that has the nice um, feature that modern people who are left-handed and want to be using a sword in their left hand, it makes no difference because these are symmetrical hilts. Now, are symmetrical hilts good or bad? Well, so in one sense they're bad, in an only one sense they're bad, they're more difficult to wear. Okay, so that's, and, and, and that's not always true, um, because in the case of the 1796 light cavalry sabre or sword, it has a very flat hilt and so it's very easy to wear because you've only got a simple knuckle bow. Okay, but anything that projects out sideways, if you have as much projecting on the left hand side as you do on the right hand side, then it's going to conflict with the body somewhat and you do get versions of this uh, 1796 Padroon which have a folding inner guard for that reason uh, to make it more comfortable to wear. Um, and in fact you do also find versions of the 1796 Heavy Cavalry which have been modified and had the inner edge cut off to make them more comfortable to wear. Now, it's not only about comfort, it's also about wear on the uniform, uh, particularly in the case of an officer. Um, officers are responsible for buying their own uniforms and the maintenance of their own uniforms, so if they get damaged, they have to pay for it. And in the case of the rank and file, um, obviously the men's uniforms are provided by the government. So the government don't want the men's uniforms constantly getting worn out and having to be replaced. Um, so therefore, if they can introduce swords which wear the men's uniforms less and um, uh, cause less damage, then they're in favour of that. So that's a sort of economical and practical point of view. From a, a sort of fighting point of view, um, if we look at a sword like the uh, French 1822 behind me, which has the asymmetrical hilt, um, it also, you could say, well, you don't need that much protection on the inner line um, because most of your hand, for a right-handed person, projects on the right-hand side, so that's where the um, protection is. However, there is some big disadvantage to having an asymmetrical hilt. And in fact, several 19th century um, authors, writers on the subject talk about this and criticise these types of hilts that are asymmetrical, particularly if they're very asymmetrical. Some hilts, uh, like the Royal Engineers um, Officer's Hilt, for example, is a bit asymmetrical, but it's not very asymmetrical. And the main reason is this, although there are two main reasons, but the main reason is to do with balance. If we have a lot of hilt projecting on one side, the tendency is for gravity to have an effect and inertia as well to have an effect when you're moving the sword around to want to twist the sword that way such that the uh, overly or the, the heavier side of the hilt wants to point downwards. This can have the effect of messing up cuts. Now I have to be honest here, um, I have noticed this effect with some hilts but equally there are some swords which look to have asymmetrical hilts that you don't have that problem with. And whether it's a big problem or not is actually dependent on various other factors like is it a curved blade, is it a straight blade, where does the point of balance lie, um, also uh, the grip, is the grip very round or is the grip quite flat. So actually there are lots of other factors which have an impact on this as well. But I do generally agree with the criticism that a asymmetrical hilt, as well as only really being uh, protective for a right-handed person, does 
tend to, if not always, it does have a tendency to lead to a twisting or the potential for twisting in the cut, which of course if you don't land with the edge true, you won't cut properly. So from that point of view, the symmetrical hilts are better because they are completely um, equal in how much mass they've got on each side of the axis. There is a second point, I mentioned there are two main points, there is another second point that is raised by um, John Latham in 1862, a lecture that was published in 1863, and that is that if you have less protection on the inside here, so we go back to the French sword for a second, if you have less protection on the inside, theoretically, because you're holding the sword on the right-hand side, if someone attacks you on this side and you guard here, you don't need as much protection on that side as you do on that side, because of if they're right-handed, the angle that their sword is coming in at, you're protected by the angulation of the fact that your arm is going across your body. So it creates a crooked angle, whereas if you're guarding on this side, the arm is uh, in more of a straight line with the sword. So you are, your hand is protected partly by geometry, but you can't always dictate that your opponent is straight in front of you. Sometimes they might attack you from over there and you go, ah, like this. Um, or indeed you might be attacked by several people um, or all sorts of other eventualities. You could be fighting on horseback. Um, you might be um, striking at someone there and someone else might strike at you from here. So if you have less protection on the inside of the guard, you are actually more vulnerable on the inside of the hand. It's not as much of a problem as is on the right in most scenarios if your opponent's in straight in front of you, which of course they always aren't, but if you have less protection on the inside, you are more vulnerable on the inside of the hand. So for that reason, as well as balance, Having a guard that projects on both sides is about the best option that you can get. And obviously a full basket hilt is the most protective type of hilt you could get. But short of having a full basket, having a fully projecting guard on both sides is a good thing. And of course, left-handers can use it. Now, just briefly, I want to say that uh, a lot of people seem to be under the impression that um, John Gaspard Le Marchand uh, designed a whole bunch of swords in 1796. He actually didn't. Uh, he designed specifically with... Um, uh, with one maker, Osborne, uh, he designed the 1796 Light Cavalry Sabre. And this is one of the most uh, desirable, sought-after um, and iconic sabres of history. And it is, without a shadow of a doubt, this is the model of sword, not necessarily a blue, blued one like this, but the Troopers version is the most sought-after sword that I get asked to try and find for people. And it is the model of sword that everybody who gets into antique sword collection seems to want to have one of. They look very, very cool. They are very, very good cutters. They're not perfect swords, but they have a lot going for them. And they seem to have been fairly well liked in their time. Although hilariously, in the Victorian period, I've actually found a lot of criticisms of these swords, contrary to what a lot of modern writers seem to be uh, saying. But anyway, um, now he designed this sword. He didn't, however, pluck it out of thin air. It wasn't modelled on the Indian Talwa, as some people say. Uh, this was a sword which was influenced more or less by uh, Central European, uh, Austro-Hungarian um, sabres that had gone before it, with some changes. Um, you know, it, it is its own model. It's not just a copy of another one, but it's very much inspired by Austro-Hungarian and other Central European uh, sabres. He did not design the Spadroon. We don't know who designed the Spadroon. It just kind of, probably it was designed by committee. Um, and it came about, again, model on swords which had gone before. It wasn't hugely different to swords that were around in the 1770s, 1780s. And in many ways, the design of hilt traces its uh, overall shape all the way back to the Walloon uh, types of swords of the 17th century. Um, now, uh, finally, the heavy cavalry sword that was brought into Britain, this was actually modelled on the earlier uh, 1769, I believe it is, yes, yeah, 1769 pattern Austrian or Austro-Hungarian palash, as they call it. So what's a palash? It's essentially, it's a large cut and thrust um, heavy cavalry sword, but we could call it a back sword. Um, and this is just modelled essentially on the earlier Austrian um, Palash. Now, so this isn't really a new design. There's some differences to it, but it's not really a new design. Um, now, why do these swords have different shapes? Well, this goes back to what I said earlier in the video, that they are for different types of troops for different purposes. I'll deal with the infantry officer's sword first and fairly briefly, because it's fairly easy to deal with. At this time, it was seen that the sword of the uh, gentry, of the gentleman class, and bearing in mind officers are gentlemen, 
Um, and particularly in the Napoleonic period, it actually, you could argue, becomes less so later on in the Victorian period. In fact, I would strongly argue that. Um, but in the Georgian period, officers were very much seen as there to inspire and lead men. They weren't really there to do fighting. Okay, um, And the, during the Napoleonic period, that did change a bit. And we see new models of sword being used by officers, the 1803 pattern sabre coming in, probably because they were finding they were actually doing some fighting and they wanted other types of sword. Uh, but in the 18th century, the sword was seen very much as a symbol and an emblem of the um, gentry, of the gentleman class. Not to say that it's a useless sword or anything like that. I'm not implying it's only a kind of wand for them to wave or anything like this. But fundamentally, this is based on uh, the uh, earlier Walloon uh, combined perhaps with the small sword hilt. So the small sword and then its relative or cousin, the so-called shearing sword or spadroon as it was often referred to. Um, and so this was seen very much as a gentleman's weapon. That wasn't to say that spadroons were only used by gentlemen, they were used by ruffians as well and pimps like McBain. Uh, but nevertheless, this is very much seen as a gentlemanly thing. And if you look at the guard, this tells you somewhat about how they were predominantly intended to be used. They were predominantly intended to be used um, with the point online as a thrust centric weapon. Yes, absolutely, they can cut as well, but you'll notice it has a double shell guard which provides a lot of frontal protection. It doesn't have a lot of cut protection, except cuts coming down there, but it has quite a lot of thrust protection. And the style of hilt is one that descends all the way back to a lot of swords that were intended to be used quite point on line. Um, so that tells you something about the way this kind of fencing that was used with these swords and also the way that these uh, swords were seen not quite as dueling weapons, but related to some dueling weapons and um, like small swords and with related hilt styles for cultural, social and fencing reasons. The light cavalry sabre I've already alluded to. So this really came in. It's got a minimal uh, hilt on it um, and that's it's just got the simple knuckle bow because that's what Central European uh, and Eastern European sabres had. That's what uh, Middle Eastern sabres had, if, even if that. Some of them only had a, um, a cross guard. Um, and, uh, you know, so this is very much of a style. So number one, this is essentially copying, as far as Britain's concerned, this is copying a style from elsewhere that traces all its way back to sort of uh, 17th century Hungarian and Polish sabres, for example. Um, so, but the theory of why, certainly in the uh, 18th century or late 18th, 1796 in Britain, why this didn't need a more protective hilt, the theory, I guess, would have been that light cavalry's job isn't necessarily to get in and duke it out with infantry or whoever, it's to hit and run. So if you're staying very, very mobile, you're hitting and running, you don't necessarily need a big hilt, but you do need something which is light and quick and easy to wear. You can get your hand in too quickly. There's no hilt to get in the way. There's no basket hilt or anything like that. You can get your hilt in too quickly. You can draw it quickly. You can get in. You can do what you need to do. And then you get out. Okay, so it's about hitting and running. Whereas, although there are cultural things in there, as I say, and it's the fact that they're copying the style of the hussars, and that's an earlier style. But anyway, um, and then finally, we get into this style of hilt, which in its own time is described as a kind of basket hilt. Now, it's not a basket hilt like on a Highland broadsword, like we'd think, which was still being used at this time by Highland um, officers. Um, and and um, it's, it's not that type of basket hilt because it doesn't have the sidebars. But if you actually just imagine it does have sidebars on it for a minute, so a bar coming down here and a bar coming down there, it becomes actually very similar to some 17th century swords that were being used in Britain. Uh, the, again, the Walloon hilts, the mortuary hilts, various types of basket hilts. So it is a very protective hilt, just with the sidebars removed. Why are the sidebars removed? Well, again, this is a copy of the Austrian uh, uh, 1769. Uh, why did the Austrian one not have any sidebars? Well, it's to do with convenience, partly. It's how quickly and easily you can get your hand in. It's to do with weight. It's to do with various mobility and of being able to um, extend the sword out. Um, the sidebars can get in the way of that. So um, basically, this is a, a style of hilt that's kind of a descendant of the earlier 17th century heavy cavalry swords that had a more complete basket. Uh, and the heavy cavalry are, at least on paper, if not in reality, more likely to get into, to plough into enemy infantry and, and duke it out and get into heavy, close in fighting and being less mobile. Um, they had kind of, certainly, 
uh, in some cases they had m more equipment heavier equipment this kind of stuff so the perception even if it wasn't the reality the perception was that they were they were more heavily equipped and they were in there to plow in and get stuck in so three very different hilts but i want to reiterate that they are all symmetrical uh, they're not all designed by the same person but i think it's very interesting that later more protective hilts uh, in some cases um, went away from that symmetry uh, and even uh, when we get into the 1821 patterns, even with the heavy cavalry um, sword, even though it does project on both sides, it projects more on the right-hand side than the left-hand side. And we do eventually get back to symmetrical hilts again when we get back into the 1864 and 1885 uh, patterns and 1890 patterns, uh, but that's many, many decades later. And during that time, there was criticism although this is a French sword, there was criticism of these asymmetrical hilts. Not just in Britain, there was criticism in France and elsewhere. Uh, Colonel Mary Mong criticises asymmetrical hilts. John Latham of Wilkinson Sword criticises asymmetrical hilts. And uh, in some cases, and I'll look at these in future videos, in fact I'm writing an article at the moment about them, in the Victorian period some officers who had the choice to order their sword how they wanted did order symmetrical hilts for this very reason, partly for protection um, a lot for balance and symmetry. Um, so I hope this has been an interesting and useful video. Uh, if you are a left-hander, look at the 1796 patterns because they're all symmetrical. There are some other symmetrical patterns of swords. Some of that's an Austrian sword behind me there. That's symmetrical. So a lot of the Swiss and Austrian and in some cases Prussian or German um, hilts are symmetrical. French swords uh, are mostly not symmetrical, unfortunately, um, although the 1829 um, mounted artillery one is because it's a simple knuckle bow. Anything with a simple knuckle bow, anything with a double shell, anything with uh, a disc guard like that, and some of the um, more traditional sabre guards, cutlasses are also symmetrical as well, uh, for the most part. Uh, not French ones again, but British cutlasses are uh, symmetrical. So there are symmetrical sword hilts out there, were they used left-handed in the period? Probably not very often, but probably sometimes. There were left-handed swords, and certainly in the case of officers, I have seen left-handed hilts in photographs. I've never seen one in person. They are very, very rare, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, the 1796 patterns, that's why there were, of those three swords, that's why they have three distinct hilt types, but they are all symmetrical. And I find that kind of interesting. Give us a like, and make sure you uh, hit the subscribe button down there in the corner. And uh, thank you for watching. I'll see you really soon again for another video on Scholar Gladiatory channel. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.